somehow, some way, we have arrived at the final weekend of October. And along this journey with me, every step of the way has been a great Paul Feinbaum and our Sunday morning recaps here on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. Paul, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, I decided just to dress up as myself. I thought that was enough of a scare for fans of Halloween. Yeah, I'm going as uh, Jimmy Neutron. I got some good bedhead this morning. Oh, you look uh, great. Yeah, I rolled out of the rack. I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to pretend to care. Um, just going to mess up the hair and have, go at it, have a cup of coffee as week nine of the college football season is in the books. Uh, look, let's start at the obvious spot because the recap of today segues us into uh, somewhat of a preview for week 10 and the first weekend of October, which, by the way, is the month everyone remembers. I was worried going into Saturday and what we've seen over the past couple of years in college football that we've morphed into, Hey man, anything can happen now with portal and, and, and on a Saturday, you can get an upset if you're not expecting it, but I'll start with Tennessee. That was the most likely spot to perhaps see an upset. Paul, there are ranked teams in the sec that can't even stay on the field with this volunteers team anymore. No, I mean, I mean, you you had to think this was this was a moment. Maybe maybe sounds crazy, but maybe Tennessee was looking ahead to Georgia, and they were for about five minutes. <laughs> um, and for some reason, once Kentucky missed that extra point, Matt, it was over. It was just like uh, we're, we're, you're not scoring again, and we're going to score as many as we want. And that's what happened. Uh, it was truly remarkable. And any doubts about that Tennessee defense were eliminated because Kentucky, is, I'm, I'm trying to make a case for them being a good team, although that's becoming, it seems like a year ago, although it was a month ago that they were ranked in the top 10. Yeah, they look, they, they did it with defense and Will Levis. Maybe their schedule proved otherwise in terms of where they are big picture. Maybe Tennessee is just that good. But I haven't seen something like this since the two, uh, uh, Jerry Judy teams of yeah. yesteryear where receivers are running wide open. It's almost as if they're uncoverable. I go back to those Alabama teams I mentioned with Tua, uh, Jerry Judy, uh, Jalen yeah, Waddle. Well, yeah, Henry Ruggs, Devontae Smith. Yeah. I mean, it was endless. It, they, they, they were always wide open. I haven't seen something like this since then. This team, is it, it appears to be indefensible. And, and I, one of my guys yesterday was saying, uh, it, this is not operative anymore, but a couple of weeks ago was that Tillman was supposed to be their best receiver. Uh, and, and he's been banged up for weeks. So uh, what, what Hendon Hooker is doing, especially with, with, with Hyatt, is, is extraordinary. Now, I'll leave it to the experts that you hang out with to, to break down next week's game, although I think it will be broken down a few thousand, maybe a few million times. I, I would hope so. If college football can't get big picture attention this week, this game right here, by the way, as we get to Tennessee, Georgia, we'll talk Georgia in a second. I think that this matchup Saturday is better than anything the NFL could throw out there. I mean, I don't even think it's close. The, 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 the game that you're going to see, the NFL wonks will say, oh, no, 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 no. Tennessee, Georgia will be the best football game on a field to this point of the season. And you're saying that as we are now in the second half, as we tape this, of the Broncos and the Jaguars in London. There you go. See, the, the, facial, ex <laughs> the facial expression and the score says all you need to know. On the Georgia side of it, I don't – look, Florida, it wasn't going to win, right? I mean, maybe a, a set of freak circumstances could have led to it, a block punt, a pick six, whatever the case might be. Georgia was going to do eventually what they, they came to do. I'll give the Gators credit. They got it to 28-20 at one point. They closed the gap just a little bit after being down. I think it was, what, 21-3? to three or it's, it, was, it was pretty separated at one point. But Georgia, let me see if, if you agree with this. Georgia's a really damn good football team. They're not an explosive football team. No, and somebody made a really good point the other day. Uh, why don't they just throw it to Brock Bowers every single time? <laughs> and it's not a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, he, he had the the catch on his helmet. He was, I think, it was our top play on college football final. He continues to be a highlight. Uh, where do you see Georgia right now through this first nine weeks of the season, headed into without question their biggest game of the season? Yeah, I I, st I would rank them a hair, uh, maybe behind Ohio State, but 
you know, all of this is so, uh, you know, irrelevant because of the committee coming out in a couple of days and this game coming up. Matt, it doesn't matter who's number one this week. Uh, the winner of this game will be number one next week. I mean, there's no escaping that. That's what I love about it. Because it, everybody's, get, what are they going to do after Tuesday? Boo Corrigan's going to be up there. Reese will be up there. The, the crew will be up there. And we'll be yelling and screaming at the first college football rankings, which we've long proven don't matter. Two, no. we know this is a television show. And three, let's just for the let's just for the sake of screaming at each other, say the top four in some semblance are Tennessee, Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State. People will be furious without thinking for a second that one of those is going to handle themselves this weekend and the other is going to handle itself Thanksgiving weekend. So to get fired up over it at this point is just wasting energy. No, and and, and again, Alabama is is so far off the uh, the main stage right now. It's scary, but they have a pretty big game Saturday night too. But you know, it, it I'm, I'm I appreciate what you said because. We don't get many moments like this uh, during. We often get it at the final Saturday, whether it's Alabama Auburn in the past, uh, uh, LSU Alabama a couple of years ago, and obviously uh, Michigan Ohio State. But th- this is, first weekend in November, we don't often get uh, a one versus two, a one versus three, and I think that's what we're going to have. You know what I love about what's taken place this year is like, and you know this better than anyone. When you cover the SEC or you follow this league. If you live down in that area, whatever the case might be, you're always aligned with one side of the conference, right? And because of my career being in Columbia for a while, I was always aligned with the SEC East. And when I was aligned with the SEC East, candidly, it was down. I mean, it wasn't what it's been historically. I love that this year, a blue blood like Tennessee can from two years rise from the dead to take on a Georgia team that's dominated the division for the past few years. And it's almost as if right now the East is getting more attention and has a better year nationally than the West has. Yeah. And and Matt, having just returned from Jacksonville, uh, we're so often on, on that final Saturday in October, the Georgia Florida game is maybe the biggest game of the day. And one of the bigger games of the year, it felt off Broadway doesn't describe it. I mean, I felt like I was uh, like the like the the Broadway show was opening in Hartford. Uh, I mean, it was not to insult where you, you know. The, the, the it was like third set, third set Cirque du Soleil, <laughs> like the third team. It was. I mean, there was no atmosphere. There was. I mean, other than Tebow's manufactured at, uh, <laughs> enthusiasm. I mean, I, I I literally slept through the weekend. It was it was that bad. Um, and because it was all about the next week, uh, e- e- even the Georgia fans were whispering, Hey, what, what, you think we can beat Tennessee? Uh, and I'm like, Oh, you're playing Florida. Uh, this is a team that used to own you, but it, it, it that's, and I just can't help but think about that January day. I was on with you on sports center and you were asking me about the, the, uh, the hypo hire. And uh, I mean, the, the easy, the easy shot was, I'm not sure anybody's too concerned about this. Yeah. Uh, it, it looked convenient. Uh, and, and it's turned out to uh, you know, be one of the hires of, 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 this, of this age. Yeah, and, and you, you bring it up because year two, right? There are times where year two of a new coach, maybe he's winning with someone else's players. Maybe, you know, the other guy was just that bad. He's found a way to get something out of it. But the quarterback's a transfer portal guy. He's been yeah. able to win with him. Jalen Hyatt was a relative no name until this year. He's found ways to make stars out of his current roster as Josh Heupel. And now you have a, a, a team that if they win, I got to look at their schedule real quick because it, all signs are pointing right now to the Georgia game, but after Georgia, they host Missouri. They mm-hmm. have South Carolina who we'll touch on in a minute. And then they end with Vanderbilt. Yeah, no, it, we were trying to hype that South Carolina game, but, uh, hard to hype anymore. Yeah, they uh, they spent exactly one week in the top 25 after losing to Missouri in the Battle of the Columbias, which this is why the Gamecocks can't have nice things right now. They get everybody excited. They went four in a row, and then they lose to Missouri. Shane Beamer did the circuit last week. Uh, he did our show. Uh, I was driving around. He was on Jim Rome. I mean, he, he was – I mean, one week in the top 25 uh, for the first time since Spurrier, and it crashed and burned. And that's just, uh, as you know, the history of South Carolina. 
You know what, though? I mean, I like that he did it. I mean, the midterms are coming in a week or so. He was trying to get out there to all his constituents yeah. and say, hey, here we are. We're here and we're here to stay. I think he's got a, they've got a good young program. Well, you know, we'll see what they can do with it. But if you go to Georgia, they've got the Tennessee game. They've got a little bit more difficult road. Yeah, they do. Mississippi State, I mean, fine. It's, it's, a, it's a road game, which is – it's an oddity because you don't see that game. But I, I, I have a hard time – making that into a dangerous game. So they've got Mississippi state, then they've got Kentucky and then they have Georgia tech. So let's call two of the final three post Tennessee. I'd put their schedule, maybe a six out of 10. Yeah. So their schedule, their schedule at least looks formidable. Yeah. Th this is for all intents and purposes, the de facto sec East championship to play in, in Atlanta uh, the SEC West still up for grabs because of a game that happened last night in College Station. Ole Miss taking down Texas A&M 31-28. You and I are both fans of Lane Kiffin because for, you know, the appearance, Lane Kiffin really doesn't give a damn what you think. And that's just who he is and that's how he is. Uh, his quote after the game when asked uh -huh. if Jim, if they had a Halloween costume or what he was going dressed as Halloween. And Kiffin says, maybe Jimbo has a joker costume for me paul these are on camera remarks that are going to just cause fires yeah and yeah we all made a big deal about saban and jimbo is the the biggest feud in college football let me let me refresh it's now jimbo and lane because matt all week long jimbo uh just just ratcheted up someone asked uh, jimbo on the sec conference call wednesday about losing dj durkin uh, his defensive coordinator to Texas A&M, the former Maryland head coach. And he said, well, we did everything we could, but we got outbid uh, by A&M. He, he, he said it seems to be a common theme with that program. Then, I mean, that's not shots fired enough before the game. Then he retweets uh, some guy having tickets for, for sale for the A&M game against Ole Miss for $2. And then he comes back a few minutes later He's got his dog, Juice, Juice yeah. Kiffin, uh, which obviously somebody runs the, the account. I don't think – unless the dog runs it. Um, Juice says, hey, Dad, uh, can, I, can I get two tickets? I want, I want to sit with Reveille, the, uh, the, the dog from A&M, for $4. I mean, where, where else do you – I mean, this is just, this is just blatant trolling – uh, and, then he, and then he wins the game, of course, which, I mean, very, very rarely the coaches double down on a game like this. But you can tell he, he, has, he, has, no, he has no love uh, for Jimbo Fisher. How did we get to this point with, with – for let, let's start with these two. How did we get to this point with these two, with now Ole Miss 8-1 and one on the season and Texas A&M 3-5? and five? It started uh, in February after in the middle of the recruiting when, when Kiffin flat out said what Saban indicated months later that, that A&M had bought the class. And then Jimbo went after him, called him a clown show. He didn't I don't think he said his name, but it was obvious. Uh, some people thought he was talking about Saban, but he was talking about Lane. And, and now this and I mean, it, it's quite a sideshow. Uh, and, and 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 here we sit. Uh, on the end of uh, at the end of October, Texas A and M, which started the season ranked number six in the country, now has five losses, uh, and they still have to play Florida, Auburn, and LSU. So Florida, let's give that a push. I think that yeah. can go either way. Auburn, I think that can go either way. And LSU, if the LSU that we see now, it depends on how they do against Alabama coming up next week, that you on paper would look like a loss for AM. Sure. So at best, you're looking at six and six. Yeah. And, you know, one thing about Jimbo Fisher, it doesn't matter what the score is, doesn't matter how many losses. You know, he's talking about the, the, the freshman, young quarterback, uh, Connor Wedgman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, great. Everything's good. You know, this man. I mean, Jimbo, but again, uh, you juxtapose that with with the eighty six million dollar buyout, and he's acting like he has uh, a lifetime deal, which he may. And they they've got UMass sandwiched in there on on November nineteenth, yeah. so those are the four remaining games. But every once in a while, oh, okay, here's how I'm going to try to phrase this: the SEC will gift us uh, a coach, a personality, but top to bottom 
Paul really a punchline. We saw it with Les Miles. He became a punchline. Even after Edo put on maybe the greatest college football team we've ever seen in 2019, pre that, he was kind of a punchline. Post that, he was certainly a punchline. It appears Jimbo's gotten to that point where I don't know that anyone's looking at this and being like, that. That that's a ball coach. And he is. I, I, I sit with people every weekend, Matt, and everyone still refers to him as a great coach and a great offensive play caller. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what are they seeing that I, I don't. I mean, I realize these are including Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks, starting quarterbacks, successful NFL players, but I, I really don't see it anymore. And I, I think you just have to be realistic. Uh, you know, he's, he has wasted a, a great recruiting class. He, I don't know where they currently are. I mean, I know they're highly regarded, but, but, but here's the issue, Matt, if, you, if, you, if you're realistic. Another loss, and, and it just feels like uh, there, there's something stuck to this program, the stigma that Jimbo Fisher can't talk his way out of. And you know, what, are, what are those players going to do? Are they going to stay? Uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him in the off season and next season. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know how Texas A&M boosters think. I have no earthly idea. I mean, we can joke about have them having all the money in the world, but nobody wants to spend this kind of money to buy a guy out. So uh, you, you have to look at this objectively. How, why did he get an extension after last season? Uh, you know, what is the school going to do if this doesn't get any better? And, and you, I'll give you a cliche here because I really don't know the answer. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, it, I would say, one, the first thing that someone's going to make him do, he's going to have to bring in an offensive coordinator. Going to have to bring in a play caller to, to okay. work with, I, I would think. I mean, they're going to – But doesn't that sound like uh, something after two years, maybe three years? Uh, and, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you say to a coach, I'm gonna, you're going to say, I'm gonna, you're going to get fired if you don't change this up. This is not, this will be his sixth year that yeah. he brings in an offense. I, I think that sounds very trite. Um, and by the way, I, I will argue, Matt, that, that sounds good for you to say, and you're right. Who's going to tell him to do that? Uh, he, he is the king of that program. Do you think he really cares what anyone else there thinks? No, no. When the AD, you know, goes to him and says, hey, you know, you need to make some changes on your staff, he'll say, okay. And then he'll just make the changes that he wants to make. Very rarely does the athletics director, typically we see it at those programs where the legendary football coach has taken over as athletic director. Mm -hmm. um, that's when you'll see the head coach capitulate to anything that the AD wants to do. I don't think Ross Bjor, I don't think this is one of those situations where it's like, Hey Jimbo, you're under some water. I need you to make some moves for me. And by the way, he can go out and, and hire a hot, shot offensive coordinator that doesn't mean he really has to listen to him i mean yeah. he's the head coach and i i will always argue the head coach should do what he wants to do uh if you have to tell a head coach you need to bring in a new offensive coordinator because we don't have confidence in you what is he being paid for i mean part of jim i mean jimbo fisher is an offensive play caller he has called plays from the first day uh he's a, he, he's been a coach that's who he is yeah, and and look, we detailed their four games coming up. Um, it's just I can't believe, you know, when you when you look at it, I can't believe we're here in year two with Josh Heupel, just as I can't believe we're here in year five of Jimbo when this hire was made. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would argue that if he did not if the if if he had not if he did not have that contract, if he if he had a normal Auburn like buyout. As we say that, as rumors fly about Auburn's coach, and you know, again, that that it, it, if that if that happens as we're talking today, that doesn't even really even qualify as breaking news that Brian Harson is leaving. He'll leave. To, he'll either leave today, next week, or the week after. But in Jimbo's case, uh, yeah, I mean, so it will cost seventeen or twenty million dollars. That's 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 a, that's an outrageous amount of money. But if if Jimbo Fisher's buyout was 18 or 20 million dollars which is the high end of, of buyouts in, yeah. in, in history i believe he would be gone yeah no question that 86 mil that's just i mean look let's just break this down to its simplest form 86 million dollars for a college football coach to go away it's you absurd. you could argue and it was a great segue to auburn said you want to touch on them for a minute you could argue, and I've had I've talked to coaches about this, and you have too. Sometimes, Paul, when they know it's not going well, the goal is to get fired because you get the golden parachute. 
Sure. And that that's, I mean, look, that that's where we are as a business right now. That the coach's like, listen, well, working out, just pay me my money and I'll go away. How many unemployed coaches do we have that are sitting on bags of cash? Sure. I, I mean, Ed, Ed Ogeron had that funny line two months ago at, at that quarterback club where, hey, when they told me uh, I was going to get $17 million, uh, I said, where do I sign and which yeah. door do I walk? <laughs> I mean, he didn't care. And and that that's, and, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm, at this point, I can't, I mean, Jimbo Fisher really deserves an Oscar for going in there every Saturday night after losing <laughs> to South Carolina and Ole Miss. It's not like he's losing to Alabama and Georgia. Uh, and, and he's, you know, and he's talking about, yeah, we're, you know, we, we got a good team and we got a great young quarterback and we got this and we got that. But, you know, if you're, and, and on top of that, remember, remember the prelude of the week. He had, he had three players, I believe suspended. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, second time that's happened. Uh, all kinds of rumors flying about around why, why were they suspended? Uh, there's just, there's just a lot about this program that, that is telling you it, it's, it's coming apart. You, you had mentioned Auburn. We know that's been coming apart for a while in terms of the coach and Brian Harson. I, I want to segue it to this. We had Hugh Freeze on with, I had Hugh Freeze on with me last week during Liberty's bye week. Uh, his name is always getting attached to open jobs, yet he just signed a contract extension with Liberty, yeah. a guaranteed contract extension. I, I have to look at the buyout. I wish I would have come more prepared uh-huh. with that number, but I just don't see any way. And I've said this about Hugh for a while now. He knows his mistake. He paid for his mistake. He's proven that he's rehabilitated his life. I lost to Sarkeesian, who got another chance. I don't know what Auburn would even be thinking if they had to think twice about bringing Hugh to Auburn. He seems to, uh, and, and I, I couch my words about Harson because every time I look down at my phone, there's another uh, Harson could go could go any minute. Har- yeah. Yeah. The reason we say that is that they're on the verge or they have already hired John Cohn as the athletic director. He's pr- coming over from Mississippi State. Why is that important? Well, they need an athletic director to technically hire the next coach. Yes. <laughs> we, we, you, can, you can fill in the blanks. We're talking about Auburn here. Uh, and, and Cohn is a very competent uh, and, and able athletic director. Uh, but that doesn't mean anything other than uh, he'll be sitting at the head of the table. But so, so Harson is gone whenever that is. Uh, and it, it's, yeah, and he, he just did a miserable job. Let's, let's move on from that. But, but you're, you're right. Uh, Hugh Freeze, I think is going to be the coach to watch Lane's name comes up, but, but I, I do think there's a, there's a lot of interest for Hugh Freeze there. I just, you know, you look at what would fit. You need a guy who can recruit the sec check. You need a guy who can win in the sec check. You need a guy whose offense is innovative. That's going to get people into the seats. Check. He seems to check all the boxes. And let's like, with all due respect to Auburn, we don't need to do the pearl with, with, with Auburn and and rules and what people have done in their past when looking for a head. And one thing that, that Auburn boosters like about Hugh Freeze, and this may sound irrelevant to people around the country, but he, he has something in his back pocket that resonates in Alabama. He's beaten Nick Saban twice. And, and that uh, it sounds cliche, uh, but not many people have beaten Nick Saban twice. And as much as much uh, as they gave Gus throughout the years, he beat Nick Saban. You, you say whatever you want about Gus and his play calling and his offense. He beat Nick Saban. He beat Nick Saban three times. It didn't it wasn't enough to, to save his job, but it, it did save his job once or twice. Right. So we, we know how that act goes. All right, I'm going to get you out of here on this one. I don't know if you've been privy to this. I, I, I didn't watch Sports Center this morning. I was sleeping. I got home late. It was a long day. Uh, okay. The Michigan Michigan State game. Michigan wins 29 to seven. Afterwards, there's been video uh, out there of a uh, one Michigan player getting jumped by what appears to be nine Michigan State players. The AD Ward Manuel talked about it after the game. Jim Harbaugh talked about it after the game. This is as ugly as it gets in a post-game situation. Yeah, I, I don't know why uh, we're still waiting for a decision here. I mean, there's no way, there's no way these guys should remain on the football team. Uh, I mean, it, it's simply outrageous behavior. Uh, I mean, it bo- well, it borders on criminal behavior. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm just saying what it looks like without knowing uh, everything about it. Uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I have a lot of uh, respect for, for Mel Tucker and, uh, if he doesn't kick these guys off the team, uh, 
then I, I don't know how he's going to be able to uh, face the music. You can't, Paul, when you're a head coach. And I'll say this. Look, Nick Saban isn't off the hook for the Jermaine Burton situation. No. I mean, I, I still think there are things that, that need to be dealt with there with some of the video that's come out. So I, I want to be Terrible. clear that this isn't – we're not just picking on Mel Tucker. But when you look bigger picture, at the end of the day, these college football teams are a representative of an academic university. And you know what school presidents and academics don't like to deal with? They don't like to deal with when the athletic program or the football team makes the bigger name of a university right. Right. look bad. They just don't deal with that. Yeah, and, and again, I, I I don't know what goes into this. I mean, to, to let them play again this year would be unconscionable. You know, whether they, you know, have a path back. And, and, and again, you're talking about a lot of players. And right. the culpability, it might be different for everyone. But I'm just saying uh, that – it's such a bad look uh, that there's no, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no word salad that you can offer to defend their behavior. And Michigan state, by the way, three and five on the season, Michigan eight, no, both teams going in a completely different direction. But when we saw that video and that video started to emerge last night, post game, I don't, you don't even know what, what even gets to the point where there's one Michigan player, at Michigan Stadium, by the way, you'd think yeah. there'd be a pack of them. How that one player even got into I, – I don't even – I don't know enough to know. I'm just – I know what the video showed. I've only seen one video of it, Matt. What I really like uh, and, and shook my head about was there's some guy videotaping the whole thing. Uh, and, and I, again, I'm. it's one thing to, to get in the middle of nine people to try to break up a fight. But if you're close enough to videotape it, you know, yeah. could, you, could you not be screaming to get somebody – I mean – there, there, there had to be people fairly close by. There were police uh, this, officers. Yeah, while well, this guy was getting pummeled, but but that one guy is videotaping it instead of screaming to a to an officer, "Get over here!" You know, we need some help. That, I've that, seen a, that, I've seen a couple of angles of it, and I still can't believe there wasn't anyone hopping in. It took the Michigan player to kind of just have enough. He just walked out of there without fighting. He, you can see in the video, he just gets up and just walks. Right. I mean, I, look. There are some things that the college football is is makes the greatest sport on the planet, and it's sometimes the pregame jawing at each other and getting everybody. There yeah. is there is zero I, place for that. No, no. Uh, I, I I I am confident they'll they'll do the right thing, and I, I, that you know, call me naive at the end of the day if they don't, because I I feel like uh, Mel Tucker is somebody who who understands the bigger picture, and yeah, and you know, this season is. Good. I mean, a year ago, I think it was a year ago this weekend, he got the extension uh, in the new contract. I mean, he, he's had a good laugh, hasn't he? Yeah, 365 days will come at you quickly. Uh, typically on this here recap on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel, I try to get out of Paul where SEC Nation is going the following week. But Fowler and Herbie ruined that for you during the broadcast of last night. They ran the SEC Nation promo. They announced for you that you will be in oh. Athens. Uh, so it, it is official. So we can, we can talk about that. I think the entire network uh, yeah. with college football minus Matt, Jesse, and Joey will, will be there in Athens on Saturday. Yeah, no, it's uh, – it, I mean, there was another good game. Uh, so this wasn't like the, the backup choice was was a uh, – you know, it was homecoming uh, at at Arkansas. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but, I mean, Alabama-LSU is a compelling game, and, and it's on ESPN, as you well know, but – this is the, this will be the epicenter of college football, as you said a couple of minutes ago, and and, and I'm yeah, it's always great to uh, to be part of a circus like this. It's going to be fun. Cannot wait to watch the coverage throughout the week. Cannot wait for this game because you mentioned it. We have three thirty. You've got Georgia, Tennessee, then the nightcap, Alabama, LSU. These are two games now. You could almost minus Alabama, Ole Miss. You could almost set the almost yeah. print the T-shirt for the SEC championship based on an outcome on Saturday, and I can't wait for it. Yeah, there. Uh, I think going opposite uh, this game, uh, the Alabama LSU game on ESPN two, Matt, just to give a plug, is Auburn and Mississippi State. In case you want to set your uh, your your DVR. No, no, I'm good. I'll uh, I'll watch it. <laughs> I'll watch it on the big eight pack in studio. Paul, we always appreciate it. I cannot believe we're saying hello to November, but here we are. What a great first nine weeks of the season it's going to be. Can't wait to bring this home with you over the next four or five weeks. Can't wait. We'll talk next week, Matt. All right. 
Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.